Good evening. I'm the Reverend Diane Daugert, and it is my pleasure on behalf of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville to welcome you to the annual Robert C. Palmer Lecture on Human Rights. The lecture series, named in honor of the first minister called here to serve the church, is an expression of the congregation's mission to create community, nurture spiritual growth, and to act on our values in the larger world. Some recent lecture presenters have included the Reverend Mary Catherine Morn, a former minister of the church who is now serving as executive director of the Unitarian Universal Service Committee, Bill Carey, author of Runaways, Couples, and Fancy Girls, a History of Slavery in Tennessee, Congressman Jim Cooper, and Rashida Fatuga, founder and CEO of Gideon's Army. So joining that esteemed and robust group of presenters this evening, we are delighted <clears throat> that this year's presenter is Lindsay Krinks, co-founder and director of education for <laughs> Open Table Nashville. I am so glad that you have decided to join us this evening. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Jessica Moore Lucas. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I serve as co-chair of First UU's Social Justice Committee. A really quick program note, after the lecture, there will be a short question and answer period. Put your questions in the chat as they occur to you, and we will read them and answer them, hopefully, after the lecture. I am really excited to introduce tonight's speaker, who has been working with those experiencing homelessness in Nashville since 2007. In 2013, she started working as a street chaplain with Open Table Nashville, an interfaith nonprofit profit that disrupts cycles of poverty, journeys with the marginalized, and provides education about issues of homelessness. In February of this year, she published her first book, Praying with Our Feet, Pursuing Justice and Healing on the Streets, a spiritual memoir that takes readers to the underside of American society, to the tent cities, slums, and underpasses, and to the front lines of movements for justice. Please join me in welcoming co-founder and director of education for Open Table Nashville, Lindsay Krinks, presenting this year's Palmer Lecture, Housing is a Human Right. Hi. Oh, thank you so much, Jessica, for the warm introduction. It's so good to be with so many kindred spirits. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of this lecture and to be presenting it tonight with you all. Um, a small housekeeping thing. I have a little one who you might hear at some point, and I also have a cat, so <laughs> those things might um, decide to insert themselves in terms of sound um, into this lecture. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first time that I heard that they, um, the idea that housing was a human right I was a bushy-tailed college senior who was deep into planning my first rally for affordable housing. I was facing a bit of pushback though. One of our top administrators of the distinctly Christian university I attended was pressuring me and the other student organizers to cancel the rally that we were planning at the behest of his friend in the mayor's office. I didn't know what to do and was desperate to find someone whose advice I could trust. What happened next was a small miracle that forever changed the course of my life. One of my new friends who was part of the Nashville Homeless Power Project back in the day, gave my number to one of the most kind, gentle, unassumingly radical men I've ever met in my life. And that man was Charlie Strobel, the Catholic priest, former Catholic priest who left his parish to serve the poor and started Room in the Inn on the streets in 1985 in Nashville. Charlie reached out to us, the little budding organizers that we were, and came over to our college campus late one night to meet with us. When I recounted the story in the book that I recently wrote, I called him a saint in sweats because he was wearing a gray sweatshirt and gray sweatpants, and I'm sure that he very much cringed when he read that description. 
But among all the many things that I scribbled in my journal later that night after our conversation with him was this note about how there was a universal declaration of human rights that was founded in 1948 and that included the right to adequate housing. It was the first time I had ever heard that in my life. To live without housing in the United States, Charlie told us, was to live in subhuman conditions. I hadn't yet seen all of those conditions in our own city, but I knew enough to know that he was right. Thanks to the help of Charlie and our friends at the Power Project, our small little bushy tail group of student organizers found the confidence to move forward with our rally. And we painted the words, housing is a human right on our cardboard signs and carried them proudly to the courthouse that day. Um, we have continued to do that over the last 15 years and now we have buttons. We're getting a little bit more savvy as you can see. <laughs> There's still a lot of work to do though. But when I heard about this idea of human rights, you know, it made sense to me, right? I was raised in a Church of Christ congregation that was very, very serious about reading the Bible. And one of my foundational beliefs were that it was that all human beings are made in the image of God. I also learned in Sunday school that we were all children of God, which essentially made all members of the human family my siblings. Now, if you actually were to really think about these ideas, they're incredibly radical or at least they would be if they were fully realized. They would be radical if we actually lived these ideas out in the public sphere and not just in the sentimental Bible stories that are relegated to our Sunday room classes. When I learned more about the history of human rights, I learned that some of the earliest recorded ideas that involved individuals having rights and being treated with dignity often came from ancient spiritual and philosophical teachings. Think, for instance, about all the variations of the golden rule that have existed. When I was reading about this, some say that five of the oldest written sources that address questions of people's duties, rights, and responsibilities are the Hindu Vedas, the Babylonian Code of Hammurabi, the Bible, the Quran, and the Analects of Confucius, which I have definitely, most definitely not read. But some say there's other Incan and Aztec codes of conduct and you can just go way back. And I started going down deep rabbit holes of Google searches and then I stopped myself um, for all of our sakes. So you're welcome. But this is such a fascinating idea to me. To vastly simplify things for the sake of this lecture, it appears that in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, there were very long tangled conversations of rights that included and also often excluded the atrocities of slavery and war, the rights of workers, the rights of some people, white propertied male people over others. But really the more modern idea of human rights didn't come into play on the global stage until after World War II and the heinous atrocities committed um, during the Holocaust. So the United Nations is established, right, in 1945, and then a few years later, they passed this Declaration of Human Rights in a landmark session. And while this declaration doesn't have legal teeth, and it's been critiqued for falling short in a number of ways, what is so stunning to me about this idea is that every, like, the idea that every person has rights flies in the face of the notion of the divine rights of kings, dictators, tyrants, and the ruling class who have, across time, found it politically convenient and sometimes religiously convenient to make claims to the contrary, to argue that certain people are discardable, disposable, and unworthy of such rights. We don't have to look far to see where that's happening today, right? So in more recent years, the UN has had this special rapporteur, and I hope I'm saying it right. Apparently it's a French word, and <laughs> I'm most definitely not French. So these special rapporteurs who they send into countries to be independent investigators of situations involving human rights. Many of you will remember the scathing report that came out in early 2018 after one such rapporteur was sent on a special mission to investigate extreme poverty in the United States. When I heard about that visit and report, I remember feeling validated in such way, in, so, in some way. 
we had been saying on the ground in Nashville with so much urgency that what we saw um, around the issues of homelessness in our city were a human rights violation. And we said this as we were burying our people. And most people, um, whether they're folks in power or just folks living their lives, just seem to shrug and go on with their days. But now there was this international independent report documenting and claiming the same things, the same rights violations. When I was preparing for this, I went back and reread that whole report. And I seriously considered reading sizable chunks of that report to you tonight because I was so enamored with it again and how they um, were so sharp in their analysis of what we're missing here in the States. But I decided against reading so many big chunks of that to you. You're welcome. You can read it online. I will um, tie in a couple quotes. But I don't want to read that because the UN rapporteur never came to Nashville. He hit a couple other southern cities like Atlanta, Georgia, and Montgomery, Alabama. But I want you to see Nashville the way we see it, the way our friends see it from below. I want you to see and hear and know what is happening in our city and that it isn't just sad and pitiable. It's not just unfortunate. It's a grave injustice, an urgent violation of human rights, something that demands our attention and our action. So many of you know, I guess all of you know now after Jessica's introduction, I'm one of the co-founders of Open Table Nashville and we do homeless outreach. And one of my favorite things about the outreach work we've done for so long is that instead of waiting for people to come into our office and come to us, we go out to where people are. We go on the streets. That is where our office is any given day. Our office isn't some, some nice place where we are trying to make a big shiny nonprofit. Often our office is our car or it's the underpass, or it's the median, or the bridge, or the tent city. And um, I actually wanted to share a few pictures um, while I'm kind of narrating a little bit of what, um, what we see on the street. So I've asked Josh if he could start the slides. Um, so if you can start those pictures. And I wanna tell you that, you know, let's see, here we go. You know, over, nearly 15 years of doing outreach work in the city. I've come to know the streets, alleys, and underpasses and slums like the back of my hand. I know the footpaths that carve through the abandoned slices of our city and open up to outlawed encampments. I've hiked countless miles on train tracks to reach the most isolated camps where people are trying to stay out of mind, out of sight, and survive another day. Some of these camps are breathtaking. They're amazing. There are hand-built sheds with generators and hospitality wings. There are skillfully constructed pallet decks that would put some of our decks to shame. There are beach areas on the river where people feed the turtle ducks and herons. And I think I still have one man in my phone as survivalist Kenny who once installed a motion-centered notification system on a tree near the entrance of his camp that acted as a doorbell when people came through. So some people are doing okay for now, surviving off the grid with a little help here and there, as long as they have their health and no major disasters strike. But most of the other sites we know, most of the sites we come across and see are not so sunny. They're more reminiscent of rundown slums in another country. Think of my friend who turned an empty refrigerator box into a winter home and tucked his body in feet first every night. I think of Cecil who converted a dumpster into his home. I think about the mother who lived in a storage unit with her two children with no running water, heat, or AC. The people who curl up on warming grates downtown in the winter only be ticketed for obstructing the passageway by the cops. Think of the couple I met last winter who are living in their car with their two and four-year-old daughters, my friend Mark, and countless others who have used other people's trash to construct forts and the rafters of interstate bridges to protect themselves from the elements. Subhuman conditions, refrigerator boxes, rafters, sweltering storage units in the summer, 
heating grates in the winter, forts where black mold blooms and freezes over your head. On a particularly cold night a few years back, I saw a man sitting in the shadows of what was then the new convention center shaped like a guitar costing over $600 million. He was shivering and ill-equipped for the cold. No blankets, only a thin canvas jacket. I stopped my car, pulled over, parked, and walked over to him, and I introduced myself. Hi, my name is Lindsay. I'm an outreach worker. I gave this spiel. His name was Thomas. And like so many others, it was cold, but he didn't want to go to the mission for the night. Did you know that the temperature has to reach 28 degrees before the city will open their winter shelters? Did you know that? There's so many people that can't or won't go to the mission. So I asked Thomas if he needed any supplies, blankets, gloves, hand warmers, toe warmers. My car was packed out, it was winter. And he told me that he could use a blanket, but he didn't have any toes. And I stumbled over my words trying to respond to him. And ultimately he asked me if I'd be willing to put the socks and toe warmers on his feet because his fingers were too numb to do the job. I bent down on the concrete sidewalk and removed Thomas's ragged boots and his thin, crusty socks. His toeless feet were like two pale flaky nubs, like stumps without branches. I got them all cut off from the cold, he told me. They ache all the time. I helped him bundle up and gently pull wool socks over his disfigured feet. I have no idea still how he managed to walk. We placed the foot warmers on top of his socks before easing them back into the boots. Thank you, miss, he said, tenderly gripping my glove in his hand. We switched numbers and I left. This is what I see out see playing out over and over again. Our friends are literally being dismembered in the shadows of opulence and entertainment. Right now, if you were to drive downtown in the shadow of the tallest luxury condo in Nashville, 505 on Church Street, where there's a glut of units, so many that they're leasing them out for Airbnbs. One of our friends is laying on the cold sidewalk on a piece of cardboard because the public bench where she used to rest was removed. This is a social sin. It's a moral failing, a human rights violation. There's literally a surplus of luxury housing in a city where the death rates on the street is climbing. In my role as a street chaplain, the thing that I do the most isn't weddings. It's not even prayer services, to be honest. It's, it's funerals, it's memorials. We bury people. I've been involved in the annual homeless memorial that we do for the last 10 years. And I actually can remember when there were about 40 people on the list dying from Nashville's homeless community each year. And I thought that number was a lot. You know, we knew a lot of the people. That's a lot of names to see in one place, 40. But each year that number's crept up. Over the past two years, it hasn't just crept up, it has spiked. Last year, we recorded 145 people who died. Um, like we couldn't even conceptualize that. So many of the people on that list were in their 30s, their 40s, their 50s. So many died of preventable causes and they would still be with us today if they had adequate health care and housing. This morning, I looked at the document where we keep track of everything just to see how many it was. Last week, it was 141. This morning, it was 146. 146 human beings, many of whom we know and love. Like this, just this year, like Susan and Jacob and Jerry and Louie, Chi Chi, Hans, and Dr. John and Michael and Simone, and I could go on. Many of them would still be on this earth if their right to adequate shelter and health care would have been respected and fulfilled. In a rich country like the United States, the UN Rapporteur reported, the persistence of extreme poverty is a political choice made by those in power with political will 
it could readily be eliminated. I want to read that again. In a rich country like the United States, the persistence of extreme poverty is a political choice made by those in power. With the political will, it could readily be eliminated. If the UN Rapporteur came to Nashville tomorrow, what would he see? This is what I want to spend a couple minutes talking about. You know, a lot of folks ask us how the pandemic has affected our friends on the streets, and it has extremely deepened the plight of folks who are already struggling and poor and fighting for their survival. If you think about last summer when the pandemic was truly unfolding and just so right, um, all the libraries and community centers closed. Those are all the places our friends go to get out of the elements, to get water, to go to the public restroom, right? This has been such a difficult time for our friends. And just like we've seen in the general population, how mental health issues and substance use issues have spiked because of the isolation and because of the extra strain, we've seen that on the streets too. A lot of our friends used to work entertainment jobs downtown. So they would clean up um, the bars and the restaurants after the tourists went home. They clean up after Bridgestone Arena and all of that was wiped out overnight. Um, and that deepened the, their poverty when the soup kitchens closed um, because of the pandemic and everything. We um, also saw a spike in visible homelessness over the last year. And that's something that's happened not just in Nashville, but across the state and across the nation. Um, the numbers in homeless encampments were just astronomically higher because of how difficult it was to be in shelters and do distancing and stay safe. Um, the shelters limited their numbers. Um, and also because of the eviction crisis and the economic downturn. So you had an incredibly terrible time. Um, and I'll be talking about what happened um, in terms of the criminalization response to those numbers in a minute. Now, our city has been able to access some um, federal funds for rapid rehousing and things like that. And we're really thankful for those, especially like the rapid rehousing that's allowing people to be in hotels. Um, but for most of those folks that have been housed through those programs, we have still yet to secure permanent housing for them. And even the vouchers, the Section 8 vouchers that are coming through with the American Rescue Plan, there's not a lot of places we can find to use those vouchers. So there's this whole scheme concocted to like incentivize Section 8 landlords and all this stuff, but we don't have the units. Nobody wants to rent to somebody for you know, $900 or whatever a month when they could be getting 1,500. So that's capitalism for you, right? Unchecked. I wanna briefly talk about what's going on on the ground with the criminalization of homelessness um, and then um, the affordable housing crisis and then just a tiny bit about healthcare. Um, to talk about criminalization, um, I actually wanna tell you about one of my friends, Alabama who um, I helped house years ago. Um, Alabama was actually in those pictures that you saw, one of the guys holding up the keys. Um, what's interesting about Alabama, his story is something we see echoed over again and again and again, every day on the streets. Alabama had been hit by a car, by cars, at least like half a dozen times. Like this dude was like a car magnet and he had been hit so many times and his legs were like literally steel. Um, his legs were just steel. And he would walk with a hobble with his cart. Um, and he looked like he was walking um, in an intoxicated way. And sometimes he was because sometimes he had a bottle in his cart, but often he actually couldn't even afford alcohol. He was just pushing his cart with his legs. And the police would come by and they would arrest him. This dude was arrested over 360 times in Nashville. We pulled it up and counted. He was arrested over 360 times, most of those for either obstructing the passageway, trespassing, or public intox. Sometimes he was, sometimes he wasn't, right? But these are petty things. Think about what would happen if the police actually wanted to enforce public intoxication downtown um, in bars, right? The college scene, the tourist scene would be decimated. <laughs> But they decided instead to decimate Alabama. So I'm working with Alabama. He's getting arrested. I literally cannot get him in housing because every time I come to look for him, the cops have him in 
uh, like they're holding him. He's either in the drunk tank for like, you know, 24 hours or they have him in jail and then they release him for time served. It's a whole thing. I can't get him in housing because I can't get him to his appointments. So I made him a t-shirt that said, please do not arrest me. Literally, I wrote it with a Sharpie. Please do not arrest me. My outreach worker is working on housing. It said that on the back. And then it said, Open Table Nashville on the sleeve. We finally got Alabama into housing. And that he, he wasn't arrested once. Once he got into housing, he, his hospitalizations dropped off dramatically and his arrest stopped. Think about how cost effective that is. Study after study across the nation shows that it's way cheaper to house people than to keep them on the streets, to keep them cycling in and out of um, the criminal justice system. Um, obviously, it's not justice. Um, and, and ERs and expensive hospital stays. Alabama died in his own place, at his own terms, with his friends around him. Um, he was not a crime. Um, he, he was a human being. We are arresting folks when we should be, um, you know, homelessness isn't a criminal issue. It's a, um, it's a housing issue. It's a social services issue. It's an economic issue. It's a public health issue. It's not a criminal issue. But we are up against so much right now. Just this spring, many of you probably heard this, the Tennessee State Legislature, who is, um, you know, really a prime group, um, they, um, many of them tried to pass legislation that would make it a felony to sleep out on public property, a felony. Luckily, we were able to mobilize quickly and we were able to defeat that bill, but we're expecting that to come back and it's already a felony to sleep on state property. So we're creating a situation um, that's incredibly difficult. People literally have no place to legally exist if they can't fit into the narrow boxes of our missions. Um, which we actually don't have enough space for if everyone were to seek shelter. But we're also seeing this year, the city close camps at alarming rates. They have closed or threatened to close over a dozen so far this year, including the very high profile Jefferson Street Bridge camp. We helped residents organize there. And there are still people that have an organized um, governance council there and are working on housing. Um, that are there thanks to organizing efforts and solidarity from many people like you. Um, there's other camps, you know, the Brookmead camp has been in the news, the West Nashville camp has been in the news all the time. But our city is moving to close these camps without giving people a place to stay. And um, there's a dozen other sites that TDOT recently sent outreach workers to say we're watching these. TDOT is, of course, Department of Transportation, right? All the interstate underpasses, things like that. They said we're watching these. We recently, um, somebody recently sent us a recording. They were listening to the police scanner of downtown Nashville. And they sent us a recording of a police officer responding to someone who called him, called and called 911 and said there was someone passed out downtown. So the police officer is responding on the police uh, scanner and he says, well, is the person a homeless type or a tourist type? There's a different response, right? The police know what they're doing. They're following into the script. They're criminalizing. It's social profiling when they criminalize folks. You don't have to look far to see the last week's shenanigans. So we raised a lot of awareness about this and um, did a lot of press about this. But, you know, last week, um, council didn't pass something that the mayor's office asked them to pass um, with funding for the American Rescue Plan. The mayor's office had asked Metro Council to include $1.1 million for bobcats, excavators, over 126 eye in the sky surveillance cameras, um, and other equipment to dismantle encampments and to monitor them. Um, and the same week, he said, Hey, he sent an email to council. Um, they didn't pass that. And he said, Hey, I've been asking a lot of funding from y'all. So I want y'all to come take a tour with us of a camp. But don't worry, we'll have police escorts for this camp. And we'll have a UTV, a utility terrain vehicle, to take you all the way back if you want to go. He's treating the very people he's getting ready to, like, literally going to demolish their homes. He's treating them like wild animals in the zoo. So dehumanizing.
there's this quote from that UN report that I wanted to read. And the UN Rapporteur said, punishing and imprisoning the poor as a distinctly American response to poverty in the 21st century. Mass incarceration is used to make social problems temporarily invisible and create the mirage of something having been done. We can move, we could talk forever about that, right? But we're gonna move to the housing crisis for a minute. We all know, you know, if we're closing all the camps, if we're criminalizing property on more and more, criminalizing um, sleeping on more and more land, where are people gonna go? People literally can't legally exist, right? Um, again, this is a human rights crisis. Um, with housing in Nashville, we, I did not have to berate these facts because every single one of you have seen the housing market change. You have seen gentrification tighten its grip on every, like the urban core, the first ring, second ring, all the way out to outlying counties. Um, you have seen gentrification change the city overnight and out of town developers try to flip entire, actually flip entire apartment complexes and trailer parks with very little notice to the tenants. In our society, we've turned something that should be a common good into a commodity. And the latest numbers that came out of the Mayor's Affordable Housing Task Force report this spring is that by 2030, Nashville will have a deficit of 50,000 units of affordable housing, most of those in the lowest income brackets, a deficit of 50,000 units. If you've ever been in Bridgestone Arena and to see every, it's hard to conceptualize 50,000, right? So if you've ever been in Bridgestone Arena with every seat packed out, that's about 20,000. So if you picture that many and then another one and then more, that's 50,000 units that we're missing that we are at a deficit of. Where are people going? We also have incredibly dysfunctional, um, a dysfunctional administration and a dysfunctional social services system right now. So we've been pushing for the need um, for an independent office of housing and homelessness. Many of you have been a part of those asks over the years and many of you are joining us for those pushes at Metro Council level now. We know it's cheaper to house folks, it's more humane to house folks. Um, we, we could solve this, we could drastically change this um, with the political will to do so. The last thing I want to say is um, just about this, sec this section. Um, you know, it's not just housing that's a human right, but it's healthcare too. Um, we are living in Tennessee, a very backward state in so many ways, that's refused to provide health insurance to most of our, many of our poorest members. And our friends on the streets are finding it so difficult to get the good physical and mental health care they need. Um, I think about my friend Horace, who was murdered. Um, he died while he had a Section 8 um, voucher in hand. We were trying to use it at an apartment complex. He was the next to move in. But he also died with a hernia, um, which made his last months incredibly uncomfortable. He couldn't get it operated on because he didn't have insurance. He had to wait an obscene amount of months for us to get an indigent care approval at Metro General Meharry, and then we still had to wait and he never ended up getting that resolved. We had a friend on the north side a couple years ago who was about to move into housing. The weekend before he moved in, his heart gave out. He died in a parking lot the Friday before the Monday he was going to move in because his body just couldn't take it anymore. I could tell you so many stories and I'm gonna restrain myself because I've already said a lot of very depressing things, but our people are being dismembered in the shadows of all of this. Um, we have a responsibility together to speak out. I, you know, some days like it all catches up with me and I'm so tired of this. I'm so tired of holding the hands of my friends who are losing their toes and feet and legs to frostbite. I am tired of crying with the friends and family members of our friends who are murdered on the streets, killed by the overt violence of a fist or a gun, or by the more subtle violence of a system that says no at every turn. 
No, we will not look you in the eye. No, you cannot rest here. No restrooms if you can't pay. No rehab without insurance. No housing if you can't afford it. You are no longer human. You are disposable, discardable. Your dignity is buried beneath the polished feet of those who profit from it all and all of us who look the other way. For us to learn to understand a city from below is a dangerous act. And to believe with unflinching conviction that housing is a human right is enough to get us all in a lot of very good trouble as the late John Lewis would say, and I think we need more trouble in the city. Like many of you, I am a mystic and a troublemaker. I am also very angry <laughs> at the system, but I know um, how to channel that anger collectively, right? I believe in the sacred right, not just to adequate housing, but to affordable, accessible, and dignified housing. If we were to truly assert these rights, if we were to band together with our collective and political will and resources, what could we accomplish? This morning, um, I was coming out of a long headache um, and I saw my phone and I almost didn't wanna look at it um, because the screen has been hurting my eyes and now I'm staring at the screen so high. But I didn't want to look at my phone um, when I got a text, but I looked at it and it was a text from one of my friends who's been in housing for a while. And we had been talking over the last couple of days about some things he's up against. And his text this morning to me said, your support strengthens me. And I just kind of stood there with my phone and my hand on my heart for a couple of minutes and took a breath. And I recently learned that the enormous sequoia redwood trees in California have surprisingly shallow root systems. And maybe, probably, many of you already know this, but it was very much news to me and I very much love trees. So I was very excited to learn this. So basically, these redwoods are magic <laughs> and they can grow to heights of over 350 feet and live for literally centuries but their roots only go down like six to 12 feet, sometimes even less. What then is the redwood secret? Instead of having one deep tap root, the great redwoods interlace their roots with each other, forming a vast network of support that not only holds each tree up, but also shares nutrients with those in need. This interconnected root system allows the trees to survive winds, storms, earthquakes, droughts, floods, and so much more. We have so much to learn from the trees. What could we all withstand together if we did that? What kind of ecosystem could we create? I believe in possibilities beyond capitalism. I believe in possibilities beyond this crappy situation we have in Nashville where we're burying people every other day in the indigent graveyard that's just north of town. I believe we are creative enough and capable enough and committed enough to change this. And that's one of the things that keeps me going. What would happen if we all came together? It is a dangerous belief. It is a dangerous thing to talk about human rights. It is a dangerous belief to believe that another world is possible, but I believe that it is, and I believe that we have the task together of envisioning and creating that world um, and supporting each other like those beautiful redwoods. Um, the more interconnected we are, the stronger we are. It has been a joy to be with y'all. Um, tonight, and I'm so excited about opening this forum up to more questions and more conversation. So thank you for having me.
Good evening. My name is Tom Surface. I'm a member of First UU Church, where I serve as co-chair of the Beloved Community Committee. The Palmer Lecture on Human Rights is a key part of who we are, both within First UU Church of Nashville and in the broader community of social activism in Tennessee. This lecture has been going for almost 40 years now, providing a platform for us to hear the voices of important civil rights people. The Palmer Lecture on Human Rights was established by the board at First UU Church in 1983 to honor the Reverend Robert Palmer, our first called minister. Reverend Palmer was a devoted social activist with particular emphasis on the civil rights movement, the United Nations, and nuclear disarmament. <clears throat> the inaugural speaker was the Reverend Kelly Miller Smith Sr., minister of First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill, with whom Reverend Palmer worked closely. We've had many notable speakers for this lecture over the years. Last year, Rashida Fatuga from Gideon's Army talked about restorative justice opportunities right here in Nashville. In 2019, we had UU Service Committee President Mary Catherine Morn talk about migrant justice and other global human rights issues. In 2018, Bill Carey discussed his research on slavery here in Middle Tennessee. 2017, it was Congressman Jim Cooper talked about government's role. In 2016, it was author Tim Weiss who talked about anti-racism. Like many things, the pandemic has made it tough to keep the Palmer Lecture going. This is the second time now we've had to conduct the lecture virtually and the resulting proceeds have been lower than usual. We've had to go into deficit spending to cover this year's costs. Please help us keep the Palmer Lecture going with your donation. You can donate to the Palmer Lecture Fund through our website at firstuunash.org. Just look for the Give button on the upper right. Be sure to select the Palmer Fund in the first dropdown. The link is also posted in the chat. Please give to this fund so we can continue to provide this important platform for the voices who champion human rights in our world. Thank you. All right, that, thank you, Lindsay. Um, I will open it up to, um, uh, we already have some questions coming in on the chat. So I will uh, go through these and read them out for you. But, but actually, before I do that, do you wanna just maybe say a little bit about, more about Open Table and, um, and what you do there? Always. I love talking about our work at Open Table Nashville. We, um, you know, what's interesting about the work we do, we're, we're an interfaith homeless outreach organization, but what sets us apart a little bit from some of the other service agencies and um, homeless service providers and outreach groups is that we are um, really interested not just in the charity and mercy aspect of um, the homeless outreach work, but we're interested in the justice aspect. We are trying to work ourselves out of a job by moving the needle to end homelessness. Um, we do a lot of advocacy. We do a lot of organizing. We helped some campsites organize this year who are facing closure at the hands of the city and the state. Um, we have combated um, incredibly destructive bills at the state level. Um, we are a very big force um, when it comes to advocating with Metro Council and the mayor's office for local policies and legislation. And um, we, we really believe that we're not a voice for the voiceless. People have their own voices. Mm -hmm. um, we're here to amplify them. So I am really, I, I run our education program right now, and it's a great honor of my life. And I co-facilitate a lot of the work that we do, the educational work we do in the community with friends on the streets. So I'm, um, we, if any of your churches, if any of your congregations, if any of your business places um, or other organizations are interested in trainings, um, please hit us up. Um, we offer a lot of different things, but, um, but yeah, we're trying to get people into housing, right? We, we're moving folks in every week, um, moving people off the streets, um, we're 
doing a lot of educational work in the community and we're trying to disrupt the cycles, especially the systemic cycles that keep people crushed and keep people in poverty. Um, so that's just a little bit more about us, but I'm happy to talk more about other aspects too. Great, sounds great, thank you. So, so first question from the chat, what can we do to help? Yeah, so thank you for asking. Um, you know, there's a few levels um, on which you can get involved. There's um, just kind of like one of the first things to do is to think about uh, it being winter soon, like now it's very cold. And just remembering to try to pack warm things in your car when you're out and about, um, making little survival kits, carrying some hand warmers, some thermal socks, some gloves, um, some things like that. That actually goes a really long way. And at Open Table Nashville, we put out where to turn in Nashville guides. Um, I'll put that link in the chat in a couple minutes um, if you're interested in ordering those and carrying those. Um, we're also in need of donations right now for winter items. And you can go to our socials or our website to find um, items that we need. The donation drives are a big help. Um, those are things that happen on a micro level, right? Um, just treating people um, like a human being when you pass them in your car, if they're on that median, it's very tempting for us to look down or act like we're on our phones and kind of look away when people are asking for help. But if we can just make eye contact and affirm their human dignity and wave, even if we don't have anything to give, um, that at least affirms someone's dignity. But certainly, I know many of you are probably already carrying stuff with you. So that is a really good way to be prepared. On the micro or on the macro level, um, we need you to be writing council members right now. Um, right now, we have posted a call to action on our um, on Open Table Nashville social media um, channels. And I think we sent it out on our newsletter as well. But there's a big, two big pushes going on with Metro Council. One is pushing to create an office, an independent standalone office of housing and homelessness. That is essential if we are going to move forward on the housing crisis in Nashville and not just be swept by any mayoral administration that comes in and says, scrap that, I'm going with something else. Or we have to have an independent office that has some teeth and can help us um, create the plan that we need to move ahead with housing and with ending the deficit. So the call to action includes that, and it also includes telling council to not fund um, excavators and bobcats and more surveillance cameras with money from the American Rescue Plan that's meant to be there for recovery. How offensive is that? To be using recovery funds to demolish the only homes people have. Um, we're actually very hopeful too. We just saw a request we're asking for more money. Like there's money right now. The American Rescue Plan is infusing money in communities. We're asking for another $10 million to go toward permanent supportive housing for those at the lowest income brackets. And, um, and it's gaining a little bit of traction. So we're also pushing for that. But we make it really easy with our calls to action because we know everybody has a life. Um, you don't need to spend you know, an hour trying to write up an email we can give you a draft and you can add what you need and send it off to your council member, but that actually makes a big difference. If y'all could look at those um, calls to action and share it with your network, um, that will go a long way. We need to boost that signal a bit more. And those are things on the micro and macro level. And I could talk forever <laughs> about more. Oh, so that's great. It, it's great to get it at, you know, uh, at, the, at the different levels. So I guess that would the, the next question was along the same lines. What are two or three things that could be done quickly by our city to improve? So so I, I think that uh, um, those are the those are the things that would fall. Um, so uh, another question: How has the eviction crisis uh, affected your work? Um, it has been a really hard year and a half. Um, the eviction crisis is still incredibly serious, um, incredibly serious. We, um, it's been wild. Like we literally can't get open units right now that are low income unless somebody dies or is evicted. 
And when they're evicted, we know we're just going to be seeing them in the cheap, seedy, bed bug infested hotels, um, needing care and, you know, it being way too expensive for them. Or we're going to see them on the streets and their families and cars are on the streets. Or they're going to be moving out of their children's school districts, um, which is incredibly precarious and going to places further away from services and transportation. Um, what's happening now is a catastrophe. And and we're thankful for the money that's been spent to try to keep people in their homes. Um, but we're still seeing huge numbers with eviction stuff and without continued support and without continued um, funding, people are going to, uh, it's going to be even worse. The numbers um, have gone up of homelessness without a doubt um, with the pandemic and the economic downturn. But, um, you know, it's, it's frantic, like um, we're thankful for the funds that exist again, um, but it is a really difficult situation. And it's just, it's so frustrating to me that we have to wait in order to get someone into housing since there's such a scarcity of low income affordable units right now. We literally are waiting, like when we get somebody moved in, it's only because someone's been evicted or died. And what kind of city, is that right like this there, there's a glut of luxury condos uh, many of those condos received tax increment financing tax funding from the city like those in the gulch like 505 condo um on church street received 25 million dollars of tiff funding um to fund them they have a glut of condos and they're sitting empty while people are dying while families are facing incredible trauma. Um, you know, I, I see stuff and I'm in North Nashville. I see stuff in North Nashville set out on the curb still. Um, the sheriff has come and done the eviction sheriff's office and everything is out on the curb. So we're working with groups like PATH um, and others. PATH is People's Alliance for Transit, Housing and Employment and other groups, Red Door Collective and others. Um, of course, Metro Action um, Commission and others. We're working with all of them to try to figure out what's going on, how we stop it. Um, we've worked with legal aid to help people know their rights and things like that. So um, so yeah, it's a big order right now and um, it's a revolving door just to the streets. Um, like it is, it is a bad situation. Hmm. Yeah. And um, you know, I will say that I'm really, I'm really encouraged by the advocacy we've seen and the people that have joined um, the affordable housing work, especially in the last several years. Um, we have recognized, a lot of people are recognizing, not just homeless advocates or activists who are like getting arrested or, or in deep in the camps, but like, everyone is recognizing how crucial it is to have stable housing. Um, our livelihoods are bound up in that. And um, I'm really thankful for all the people that have joined in the work. The other thing I'll say is, um, you know, it's not just um, the man-made disasters like the economic downturns or the pandemic or the recessions or whatever, but during the tornado, so our home was um, our home was hit with the tornado, and we lost our home and our cars um, when I was five months pregnant, and we had insurance, um, and we've rebuilt. So I'm um, this beautiful bookshelf. My friend Wendell from Tent City made this for us in our new home that we rebuilt. We're really thankful, but you know, developers, out-of-state developers, um, and venture capitalists, they know how to take they know how to take advantage of a crisis. They swooped in to our neighborhood and within less than 24 hours, we were getting calls. Um, so many calls about, oh, we're so sorry. Would you like to sell your home? We'll give you cash. We'll give you cash. This happened again and again and again. People know how to capitalize on a disaster, but we know things that they don't. That is that our liberation is bound up together and we are fierce defenders of each other. We have to take this to the streets when our complaints aren't being heard, when our advocacy isn't being heard. So um, I hope that y'all will continue to join us um, in doing that because 
the forces that are organizing for profit are incredibly powerful and savvy, and we have to be too. Yes, great. What well, one last question, Lindsay, about children? Can you talk about how many there are? With yeah, yeah. So um, the last that I, the last number that I saw um, was from Catherine Knowles, who is she's the head of the Hero Program um, in Metro National Public Schools that really looks at homelessness in schools. So the last number I received from her was in the last school year. Um, there were around 4,000, just shy of 4,000 homeless school-aged children in Nashville that were um, said to be without an address. So they were doubling up or they were literally in the shelters. And we know that number is high, but it misses so many. Like it misses all the children that aren't in school, all the children that aren't of school age, all the children that are under the radar or don't get counted because they're not detected, right? As not having an address. So we know the number is much higher than that. But what's so offensive is that in, in the United States of America and in the, the Bible Belt of all places like Tennessee and other areas, surrounding areas, our child poverty rates are some of the highest in the nation. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that, um, that is a moral failing um, of our leaders and of us when we fail to hold people accountable. So um, we've, we've got to do more with that. Thank you for bringing that up. And we had one more question come in about how how is the pandemic affecting homelessness and uh, uh, and with the COVID federal money coming in, how will that best be put to use? Um, yeah, um, you know we only have a couple minutes left. I'll say the pandemic because really it's not the pandemic was never an equalizer, right? Um, people who are wealthy have continued to grow in wealth. Many of them. Um, but folks that were barely just hanging on had everything ripped out from under them um, when the economic downturn came. It has been um, incredibly difficult and we've seen the mental health toll rise. We're seeing the opioid crisis really like thicken, like tighten its grip on encampments and other areas um, because people um, have so much trauma and nowhere to turn and they're self-medicating. Um, it's been incredibly difficult. We are we're asking for that federal money to be spent on housing, on permanent supportive housing and support services around that housing, because the only thing that ends housing or ends homelessness is housing. Um, so we'd love to buy up some hotels. Um, other cities have done that. We have put that to Nashville a number of times. We'd love to see some hotels bought up. There are certain, there are a number of hotels in Nashville that could be, um, and we'd love to see those flipped into affordable housing. Um, the only way we're gonna make a dent in homelessness is through the work of housing and support services. So um, we will keep making lots of noise and trouble about that. <laughs> and I know that many of you will mm -hmm. keep joining us um, because it is just so nice to be with so many kindred spirits. And I really hope to um, stay connected with y'all. Um, so thank you all again for having me tonight. Um, it's been really nice to be with y'all and to have a space to share these things um, from not just my heart, but from all of us at Open Table Nashville. Um, so thank you. Well, thank you, Lindsay. It's wonderful uh, to, to hear the stories as hard as they are. And we really appreciate you coming and uh, talking to us tonight and, and all the work that you do at Open Table. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. Thank you. Solidarity forever. <laughs> All right.